Alaska. The Native Americans of the area called it Alieska, which means the great land. A land of far horizons, magnificent mountains, rushing rivers, abundant wildlife, and great glaciers. Alaska is America's last frontier, stretching from the wild tundra above the Arctic Circle to the southeastern panhandle with its immense fjords and dark shorelines. A vast wilderness land, one-fifth the size of the continental United States. It's larger than Texas, California, and Montana combined. In a land with only 10,000 miles of road, much of the state is inaccessible by car, so boats and planes are common. Every trip in Alaska is an adventure. The interior of Alaska is a land of millions of lakes and tall mountain ranges that stretch from horizon to horizon, dwarfing the people who live there. Alaskans are a diverse and energetic people, moving vigorously into a changing future while holding on to the traditions of the past. In Alaska, a man or a woman can still dream about building a cabin in an isolated valley. For this spectacular and beautiful land is not filled with people and industry in contrast to so much of the world. This is the wildness of the past. Much of it is held in trust in the national parks for future generations. For the explorer and adventurer, there's no land like Alaska, where huge rivers of ice flow down between mountains that are unclimbed and unnamed, silent sentinels to the majesty of the area. The Alaska Range, a bow-shaped wall of mountain that arcs 600 miles across the interior of Alaska, contains spectacular examples of the great forces that shape our planet in this geological showcase, great masses of granite thrust themselves into the sky while crevassed rivers of ice wind down their slopes. Of North America's 20 tallest peaks, 17 are found in Alaska, and dominating all others is Mount McKinley. Surrounding it is Denali National Park. Until recently called Mount McKinley National Park, it's located in the center of the state, a broad upland tundra region presided over by Mount McKinley and one of the best game viewing areas in the United States. When the park was created in 1917, it contained over 2,600 square miles. But today, after passage of the Alaska Lands Bill in 1980, the park has been expanded to 7,500 square miles. Originally, access was difficult, 
but today the visitor can arrive by car, train, or plane. But if the visitor wants to travel inside the park, and you have to go inside the park for a close-up view of Mount McKinley, you travel some 70 miles on a dirt road. Many visitors are disappointed. For 40% of the time, Mount McKinley is obscured by rain and clouds, preventing a good view. But should you be fortunate to camp at Wonder Lake on a clear day, your backdrop will be the tallest peak in North America, called by the Indians Denali, the Great One. It rises more than 20,000 feet above sea level. Far from being an icy landscape, each season brings its own rewards. With spring, a profusion of wildflowers carpets the tundra, where microclimates close to the soil are much warmer than the air temperature a few inches higher. Approaching winter brings the bright hues of fall. The park provides a wide range of visitor services from campground talks to escorted walks across the tundra. Popular are the dog sled demonstrations held near the park headquarters. These dogs are used during the winter months to patrol the vast area of the park. The park service also provides a free shuttle bus for visitors. And from that bus, you can see much of the wildlife of Alaska, including the grizzly bear packing away food, building reserves of fat for the winter. The grizzly is the undisputed master of the land. The caribou pass through the park as they migrate long distances each year to satisfy their breeding and grazing needs. The Arctic ground squirrel eats constantly to build reserves for hibernating during the winter. The doll sheep, related to the bighorn sheep of the Rocky Mountains, are the only wild white sheep in the world. Currently, over 1,000 sheep inhabit the park, with both ewes and rams having horns. They can often be seen on the hills and cliffs along the park road. One of their neighbors is the willow ptarmigan, the Alaska state bird. It's also called the Alaskan chicken. They're the most common bird in the park. The Arctic fox hunts relentlessly during the summer months, for it has a den full of kits that must be fed. The vast open spaces of the interior, mountain, muskeg, forest, lake, and stream, are a symbol of the wildness of this land. Hundreds of miles without towns, electric lights, roads, signs, or people. The last great frontier in America. Alaska is a diverse land, full of contrasts and extremes. To the far south of Mount McKinley is the Inside Passage, southeastern Alaska, a boater's world of channels, passages, sounds, bays, fjords, and over 1,000 islands ringed by the green of dense spruce and hemlock forests. Hidden along the wild coastline are small towns, islands of humanity in the fog. As the moist air of the Pacific flows over the mountains of the Panhandle, it dumps hundreds of inches of precipitation in the form of snow at higher elevations, forming the great glaciers of the area, which for eons have shaped and formed the mountainous landscape. This land is the home of a rich native culture, that flourished in this wet and mild climate. 
the Clinkets, Haidas, and Simsians migrated to the tidal areas of southeastern Alaska thousands of years ago. They developed an intricate art and lifestyle in harmony with the land. The salmon, trees, and forests supported and sustained them. With abundant food sources, their craftsmanship flourished, a unique abstract style featuring stylized fish and animals. Their art reveals stories about tribal and clan legends, history, and traditions. At Totem Blight State Park, disintegrating totem poles were reconstructed in 1930, along with a ceremonial house. Drama, dances, and song performed in the house tied families to a supernatural spirit world. Today, the Tlingit Indians, the largest tribe in Alaska, are enjoying a cultural revival and participating in the development of the areas in which they live, such as Ketchikan. Called the Gateway to Alaska, it is the first major town after Seattle on the Alaskan Inside Passage, an important fishing port and the fourth largest city in Alaska. A long and narrow town, many of the businesses are perched on piles above the water, while homes cling to the steep hillsides. It's been described as a city two blocks wide and five miles long. Creek Street, the once famous red light district, is now a major tourist attraction, with shops, homes, and apartments built on piles over the creek. Ketchikan, like many frontier cities, had a spicy early history, and Dolly's house, a one-time brothel, is now a museum. Originally a Clinket Indian fish camp, salmon and then gold sparked the development of the town. The self-proclaimed rain capital of Alaska, Ketchikan receives an average of 154 inches of rain a year, promoting the growth of heavy forests that surround the town. These forests sustain logging, which is an important part of the economy of the region. The wood processing industry and a thriving fishing fleet of crabbers, seiners, trollers, and gillnetters keep the city busy outside the tourist season. The legendary wet weather gives the misty fjords its name. Only 30 miles from town and accessible only by boat or float plane, the beauty of this ice-carved land is raw and untamed. Trees grow from the water to the mountaintops, ringing the main channel, which is almost 100 miles long, an exceptional length for a natural channel. This is prime wildlife habitat. Many communities in the isolated panhandle can be reached only by air or by sea, so the Alaska State Ferries play an important role in the communication network of the area. The ferry system is appropriately called the Marine Highway, and a fleet of modern ships carry passengers and vehicles throughout southeastern Alaska. The blue canoes, as the locals call them, are very relaxed and informal. Although staterooms are available, most people sleep on the decks, which are covered and heated, or in the lounge areas. In addition to on-board entertainment, there's always an eagle, waterfall, whale, or changing view. Sailing on a cruise ship up the inside passage of Alaska is an exciting vacation trip, and many people return year after year to experience the splendor of the landscape. Over 150 cruise ship visits are recorded in Alaskan ports each year as the international crews work with local pilots to navigate the intricate waterways. The well-organized itineraries include stops at most of the important highlights. This is not the rugged way to see Alaska, but a floating resort that carries the visitor with all the comforts of home. The highlight of most cruises is the arrival in the early morning into the jewel of southeastern Alaska, Glacier Bay, a 
a wonderland of mountains, glaciers, bergs, fjords, and wildlife. 200 years ago, when Captain Vancouver first sailed the area, Glacier Bay was covered in ice, some 4,000 feet thick. It then began one of the most rapid retreats of a glacier system in recent history and left behind the Barren Bay, now almost 70 miles in length. One of the reasons the bay was created as a national parkland was so that scientists could study the changes that occur in an area after the retreat of the glaciers, including the way that plants such as fireweed recolonize the land and help to restore the forest to the shoreline. At the entrance to the bay, a spruce and hemlock forest is approaching maturity, and salmon are returning to spawn in creeks once covered in ice. With the immense weight of the glaciers gone, the land is rising and the shoreline retreating. The interior of the bay is the home of the humpback whale, also called the singing whale. They weigh over 45 tons and grow up to 50 feet in length, yet feed on a small crustacean called krill, a little shrimp-like creature about the size of a fingernail. Most visitors to Glacier Bay come by cruise ships which travel deep into the heart of the bay, where passengers marvel at the massive glaciers which pour out of the mountains of the Fairweather Range to the water's edge, tidewater glaciers whose giant pinnacles of ice called seracs break away and fall into the bay, leaving behind bits and pieces of ice that are home to the hair seals which give birth to their pups on the ice. Approaching a glacier by kayak brings a sense of the awe and beauty that this wilderness inspires in visitors, a land where the forces of nature are not yet tamed. Just 70 miles from Glacier Bay is Juneau, Alaska's capital, and the hub of air and sea transportation for the southeastern part of the state. Sandwiched between the mountains and the sea, it's a modern city bustling with importance. As the capital, its skyline is dominated by government buildings. In area, Juneau is the largest town in North America, sprawling over 3,000 square miles. During the summer months, the streets are filled with tourists who explore its attractions, such as the Governor's Mansion, the Alaska State Museum, the Red Dog Saloon, and the narrow main street filled with gift shops. In Juneau, enjoy an Alaskan tradition, the salmon bake, or a less traditional river ride. Nearby Mendenhall Glacier at the foot of the Juneau Ice Field offers a close-up look at a glacier. On a back street of Juneau is located the oldest Russian church in southeast Alaska, St. Nicholas Russian Orthodox Church, dating from 1894. It's been in continuous use since that time. Juneau is the present capital but before Juneau, Alaska had another capital, Sitka. The extinct volcano, Mount Edgecombe, looks down upon historic Sitka, the fifth largest town in Alaska, located on Baranoff Island. It was called New Archangel by the Russians. The economy is heavily oriented toward fishing, 
but tourism is rapidly expanding as visitors explore attractions such as the Pioneer Home, built in Sitka in 1913 to care for the Alaskans over the age of 65. It was the first of several such pioneer homes. Many of Alaska's historical happenings were recorded at Sitka, and today it reflects those in its historical monuments. The Tlingit and Haida culture is preserved at Sitka National Historical Park, where an important battle was fought in 1804 between the Russians and Indians. Nearby Sheldon Jackson Museum, founded by the Presbyterian missionary, contains some of the best examples of native art and Russian relics in southeastern Alaska. During the Russian period, Sitka was the capital and headquarters of the Russian American Trading Company. They ruled the area for over 100 years and their influence is still felt. Sitka was considered the Paris of the Pacific for its rich and cosmopolitan life. The jewel of the city was St. Michael's Cathedral, built in 1844. When it was destroyed by fire in 1966, many citizens heroically saved relics and art, which are now housed in an exact replica built 10 years after the fire. The Russians first came to Alaska in 1741, and by 1830, a full decade before Americans had crossed the Mississippi River in strength, the Russians had spread their settlements up and down the coastline, trading in fur seals and sea otters. Then, at the zenith of their empire, Russian America became American Alaska in 1867. At first, they called it Seward's Icebox, until gold was discovered in the Klondike. Then the rush was on. By the thousands, they poured into the port cities of Skagway and Dai. At no other time or place in recorded history have so many voluntarily subjected themselves to so much agony, misery, death, and glory as the 30,000 that struggled over the Chilkoot Pass in the winter of 1898. Once over the pass, they dropped down to Lake Bennett in Canada, where they built their boats. When the ice went out that spring, over 7,000 boats set sail down the Yukon to the gold fields. This was the insanity, the craziness of gold. The legacy of the gold rush is still found in Skagway, nestled in the mountains at the head of Lynn Canal. Today, except for the cars, Skagway looks much the same as it did during the hectic stampede to the gold fields. The Klondike Gold Rush National Park commemorates that famous gold rush, and the park visitor center is in the railroad depot. Boardwalks and horse-drawn carriages keep alive the frontier spirit. The town is now being restored by private funds and government monies. Most of the storefronts are authentic turn-of-the-century buildings. Over 90 of these buildings remain from the Gold Rush era. The Arctic Brotherhood Hall, built in 1888 and covered with 20,000 pieces of driftwood, is the location of the Skagway Convention and Visitor Bureau. In the old days, Skagway was one of the most lawless cities in the West. Gunfights, robberies, and murders were common. The most famous outlaw, Soapy Smith, opened a telegraph office and charged $5 to send a telegraph to the lower 48. Unfortunately, there were no telegraph lines to the lower 48. The vigilante shot Soapy. Most stampeders didn't spend long in Skagway. They wanted to get to the gold fields. Carrying their gear on their backs, many walked over a thousand miles as they relayed the 1,500 pounds of supplies required by the Canadian police. Today's modern traveler 
has the advantage of lightweight packs, dehydrated food, and lug-soled boots to travel the same 33 miles, a journey which usually requires three to five days. Each year, about 2,000 hikers cross the pass. For the Stampeders, it was a rugged and awesome place. In addition to the difficult terrain, over 70 feet of snow fell that winter. Many didn't make it, some turned back. Others died in gunfights and avalanches. What they left behind remains exactly where they dropped it, part of a bi-national park, half in the United States and half in Canada. They call it the longest museum in the world. Just below the summit of the pass, they found a 45-degree slope in which they carved out steps called the Golden Stairs of the Chilkoot. An endless line of stampeders carried 100-pound loads to the top and then repeated the process as many as 30 times. For today's explorers, it's not the lure of gold, but the beautiful view from the summit, where it's all downhill on the Canadian side of the border to Lake Bennett. At Lake Bennett, they built their boats, and in addition, they constructed St. Andrew's Presbyterian Church, a church that was never used because the congregation sailed away before they finished it. Next to the church was a stopping point for the Yukon and White Pass Railroad. This was the railroad that killed the Chilkoot Trail. The builders claimed to have built their track over a land too cold for a polar bear and too steep for a billy goat. Amazingly, they only built one tunnel, but many bridges, including the one over Dead Horse Gulch, where 3,000 animals died in the rush for the gold fields. Today, the railroad is a bit of history, for the new road between Skagway and Whitehorse killed the railroad. Today, travelers can parallel the trials and tragedies of the gold rush route while enjoying the scenery in modern comfort. For the early travelers, the mighty Yukon River was the first highway in Alaska and the Yukon Territory. Canoes, rafts, and riverboats used it. At their peak, over 150 riverboats went up and down the Yukon. Today, there are none. A couple have been restored. Most that remain are wrecks, rotting and decaying on mud flats along the river. Sad mementos of an historic period when these proud and elegant boats ruled transportation in the north. They stopped for individual miners to drop off food and pick up gold. Their most important stop was called the City of Gold, Dawson. Located at the confluence of the Klondike River and the Yukon, Dawson City was planned for 30,000, but many more showed up for the party. At its peak, it was the largest city north of San Francisco and west of Winnipeg. Hundreds of millions of dollars in gold were taken out of the field, but most stampeders went home broke. They were too late. In contrast to the lawlessness on the U.S. side of the border, there was not a single robbery or murder in this Canadian city. Parks Canada is actively involved in restoring the territorial capital of the Yukon, where many buildings have been used continuously since the gold rush period. Each day during the summer, the shooting of Dan McGrew and other favorites are recited on the front lawn of the cabin of the poet of the far north, Robert Service. The frontier spirit continues in the Yukon.
Gold fever still runs high in Alaska. There's gold to be found in the streams, and if the price of gold were to go high enough, it might be economical to start the dredges and go over the alluvial deposits in the river valleys. But now, there's a new gold in Alaska, black gold. And with it came the pipeline that did so much to change Alaska. To build the pipeline, they first had to construct the haul road over some of the most difficult terrain in North America. And then, after a tremendous legal and environmental battle, they built the 800-mile-long pipeline to the most exacting standards to carry oil from the North Slope to Valdez. That pipeline did more than divide the last major wilderness area in the United States in half. It changed Alaska forever. Along with the pipeline came a boom like no other before it. While for many Alaskans, a quiet way of life disappeared forever, the boom brought development to others, such as the residents of Fairbanks, now Alaska's second largest city. It has a busy commercial base and the northernmost institute of higher learning in the world, the University of Alaska, founded in 1917. It provides excellent educational programs to students from Alaska and around the world. On the campus is the University of Alaska Museum with its natural history displays and gold exhibits. Alaskaland was created in 1967 to commemorate 100 years of American ownership of Alaska. It's a mini tour of the 49th state that includes boats, trains, cabins, and museums. Some of the historic buildings were brought from the streets of Fairbanks. Taking the stern wheeler, the Discovery, is a chance to look at the old Alaska when it was an isolated land accessible by dog sled during the winter and stage and riverboat during the summer. One of the factors that helped to bring development to the great land was the Alaska Railroad. Built by the federal government, it connects Fairbanks with Anchorage and Whittier and the sea. It takes visitors over some of the more scenic areas of the state. Many visitors to Alaska are surprised to learn that Alaska has a thriving farm industry, much of it centered in the Matanuska Valley under the Talkeetna Mountains and Pioneer Peak. It was originally settled by members of the Matanuska Colony, a federally sponsored group of settlers that came to Alaska during the Depression years to develop Alaska's rich farmlands. Some of the old farm buildings still dot the valley floor. Today, they use modern agricultural methods, and the valley is known for its vegetables, which flourish in the 120-day growing season that includes up to 19 hours of sunlight. The valley is not only an important agricultural area, but also a recreational playground with many lakes dotting the valley floor. Alaska is a land of over three million lakes. These lakes are the home of much of the wildlife of Alaska. Each year, millions of birds fly from all parts of the world to make their home on the wilderness waterways of Alaska. These same lakes are used by people, for the summers in Alaska can be mild, and on warm days, the lakes are filled with fun seekers, many of whom live only 40 miles away in Anchorage. A modern, growing city with an impressive skyline of buildings that seem out of place in the wilderness.
two-thirds of the state's population live within its greater trading area and utilize its modern resources from shopping malls to department stores. It's the financial and business heart of the state, as well as the center for education and the arts. In contrast to the surrounding modern buildings, the rustic visitor center is a reminder of Alaska's frontier spirit and hospitality. Convenient and contemporary restaurants and hotels line the streets, along with shops catering to the visitor. Anchorage is called the air crossroads of the world. For each year, over three million visitors pass through its international airport. Lake Hood, adjacent to the airport, is the busiest seaplane base in the world and jumping off point for many adventures to the interior. As winter comes to a close, Anchorage prepares for what it calls the last great race, the Iditarod Trail Sled Dog Race. Dogs, sleds, and people tangle up the streets as teams sort themselves out for two weeks on the trail. In 1925, teams of mushers relayed diphtheria serum to Nome and prevented an epidemic. About 65 racers each year reenact that grueling event now, a 1,049-mile race through storms and across difficult winter terrain. Rex Swenson from Manly, looking for victory number five this year. One of the earliest travelers was Captain James Cook, the intrepid English explorer whose statue at Resolution Park overlooks the waters that bear his name, Cook Inlet. The rise and fall of tides in the inlet is tremendous and sometimes reaches 40 feet. Development of Anchorage waited for the Alaska Railroad which Congress authorized in 1914. The railroad opened the interior the year round. The once federally operated railroad is now run by the state. The city grew through a series of economic booms until March 27, 1964, when it was devastated by an earthquake registering between 8.4 and 8.6 on the Richter scale. This was the most powerful earthquake ever recorded on North America. The earth shook, streets fell 15 and 20 feet, buildings toppled and homes disappeared. At Earthquake Park on Kinnick Arm, the tortured landscape hasn't been touched since the quake although the growth of trees and shrubs have softened the torn land. Following the Good Friday earthquake, Anchorage residents in the pioneering tradition rebuilt their homes, businesses, and schools. It is the largest city of Alaska, but it is only minutes from the magnificent scenery of the state, such as the Kenai Peninsula and Portage Glacier, the deep blue glacier and the icebergs that float in the lake at the face of Portage Glacier are a popular tourist attraction, one of many in the varied and interesting peninsula area, which has become a playground for many Alaskans. With its snow-capped peaks and rushing rivers, the Kenai Mountains have been called the Switzerland of America. In this rugged land, travel is often difficult, and the many floatable streams in Alaska provide a convenient and sometimes the only access to areas of the state during the summer.
During the winter months, up to 50 feet of snow can fall, providing an excellent base for cross-country skiing, which can extend well into the spring. When the slopes are dry, another group of sports enthusiasts use the hills, hang gliders. Some of the gliders soar two and 3,000 feet above their takeoff point, which is already a 3,000 foot hill in Alaska. The most popular sport in Alaska is fishing, ranging from netting candlefish, which resemble smelt as they swim upstream to spawn, to the even more popular salmon fishing. When the fish are running and the streams are open, Alaskans by the thousands line the major rivers in hopes of catching one of the species of salmon, the largest of which, the king salmon, can weigh up to 93 pounds. Alaskans enjoy good fishing, clean air, and a relatively pure environment, largely because so much of the country, perhaps 95% of it, is undeveloped. But that is changing fast. The first major oil find in Alaska was not Prudhoe Bay, but the Cook Inlet Middle Ground Shoals of 1957. Today, offshore rigs pump oil and natural gas out of the Cook Inlet. This once quiet area has changed into a bustling business zone, but there are still views little changed from the days of the Russians. The moose in the Kenai National Wildlife Refuge are probably unaware of these changes as they follow a cycle of life that has existed for eons. In the fall, the males challenge each other in tests of strength. With long sunlit days and seemingly endless sunsets, this is the land of midnight sun. The end of the road on the Kenai is Homer, a small fishing and artisan's village. Surrounded by the rich waters of Kachemak Bay, it's one of the best marine fisheries in the United States. From these waters, they take salmon, halibut, crab, shrimp, and an abundance of other seafood. Fishing is one of the largest industries in Alaska, and the sports fisherman is not left out. It's and the sports fisherman is not left out. It's not unusual for a family to go out with a crab pot early in the morning and bring back a feast of crab to enjoy on the beach in the afternoon. On the other side of the Harding Ice Field, one of four in the USA is Prince William Sound and the Columbia Glacier. A close-up look reveals a three-mile wide expanse of ice that's over 200 feet high. The ice has taken hundreds of years to reach the sea.
by motorboat or sailboat, exploring Alaskan waters with doll porpoise cavorting about the bow is an adventure. At the entrance to Cook Inlet are the barren islands, where little but short grass and flowers survive on the slopes, but along the water's edge is found one of the largest sea lion colonies in North America. Sea lions are marine mammals who spend most of their life in the sea, feeding on bottom fish and stealing salmon from the nets of fishermen. In the water, they're very graceful, but out of the water, they're slow and awkward. The animals enjoy basking in the sun and are fairly sociable, except during the time that the pups are born. At this point, the female wants no interference and vigorously defends her area. Each year, about 3,000 pups are born. The young pups face a difficult life at first, for should they crawl away from their mother's area, they'll be forcibly evicted. The pups will grow into adult stellar sea lions, much larger than their California cousins. The male stellar sea lions weigh up to 1,250 pounds. They need all that fat. For several months of the year, they eat nothing while struggling with other males for the control of a harem. The Alaskan coastline is dotted with small, isolated villages, such as Seldovia. The Russians originally named it Seldovoy, meaning the Herring Bay. The Russian Orthodox Church sits on the hill, still used today by Native Americans. Fishing has remained a dominant industry. Many of the homes were destroyed in the 1965 tidal wave, but most surviving houses in the inner harbor are still on piles. There's a special innocence and charm to these towns, something often lost in the busy lower 48. Across the Cook Inlet from Seldovia and down the Alaska Peninsula is Katmai National Park and Preserve. This wild and remote landscape of lakes, mountains, forests, and sea is one of Alaska's oldest park areas, set aside in 1918. Difficult to travel to and through, it's one of the great wildlife refuges of Alaska, for along the rugged and wild rivers can be found, during the salmon season, the brown bears of Alaska the world's largest predatory land mammal. The brown bear is a local race of the grizzly bear. The concentration of bears at the McNeil River are among the largest in the world, as up to 60 bears can be found in a day. The females are very protective of their young and will readily drive off a larger male, although the larger bears usually get the best fishing spot. Early in the season, the bears eat all of the fish. Later, just the eggs are eaten. The area was created as a national parkland, not for its scenic beauty or wildlife, but because here, at the turn of the century, the most violent volcanic explosion in the last 100 years on the North American continent occurred. It was eight times more violent than the Mount St. Helens eruption and created a valley which at one time rivaled Yellowstone. All that remains now are 100 foot high pumice cliffs and a stark, desolate, brooding valley. The dead valley of 10,000 smokes.
Lake Iliamna and Lake Clark regions are part of this vast land. With thousands of lakes, it's very popular with fishermen who can find their own isolated fishing heaven. Far to the north in Alaska is the home of the Eskimo people. Theirs is a very old culture that goes back almost 10,000 years. Traditional hunters and fishermen, they continue to hunt during the winter, and the main focus of life in the summer is fishing. The fish are dried on racks in the sun. It's a time of celebration and reviving old traditions. Today, their lives are changing rapidly. Many now work outside the village, and modern conveniences are part of their life. To help cope with the changes, the native corporations using money from the Alaska Lands Bill and oil revenues are developing new industries. Along the Kobuk River, jade is being mined in five and 10 ton blocks. Young Eskimos are being trained to shape the jade. In Kotzebue, Eskimos run tourist facilities and a cultural center that preserves and explains their rich history and culture. Their wild and remote land stretches from the Bering Sea to the Arctic Ocean and includes the Brooks Range of Alaska the northernmost wall of mountains in the United States. This is America's largest remaining tract of wilderness land. In this awesome sweep of land south of the Arctic Ocean, the airplane with floats or the canoe or kayak are the principal means of transport. This is the wild Alaska, a special place of remote canyons, rugged peaks, wild rivers, pristine lakes lost in the expanse of haunting beauty. For the wilderness traveler in the gates of the Arctic National Park or on the Kobuk River, time has been suspended. This is the home not of man, but of animals, a great refuge for the wildlife of Alaska. Alaska is changing. Cities are growing larger. Development is increasing. But there are still rivers that flow unimpeded to the sea and skylines untouched by man in the great land, Alaska. Alaska.